one morning, my mom saw me plucking my right eyelid and slapping my eye. Why won't I stop twitching? I growled. Let me see, she said. So I looked at her and sure enough, a little flop of skin on was doing a funky solo dance, seemingly unaware of the angry furled eyebrows above and the leering lips below. Ooh, someone's talking about you, she said giddily. <laughs> what? I was nine years old. Who the hell could be gossiping about a nine-year-old girl on a Saturday? When your right eyelid twitches, someone, someone is gossiping about you. When your left eyelid twitches, you'll be getting some good news soon, she said with total assurance and went back to her business. I slouched back onto the couch, helpless and defeated, bested by an opponent no larger than the size of a nickel. Roughly 20 more minutes passed before I was able to see normally again. <coughs> now, unless you had a really good bullshit detector when you were a kid, you generally accepted what your parents told you at face value until you knew any better. For me, accepting what my mom said oftentimes meant living in a life of magical, superstitious thinking. Avoid the number four. It's bad luck because it sounds like the Chinese word for death. <laughs> we can't have the foot of the bed facing any mirrors because ghosts. <laughs> we hang giant, flashy, golden car ornaments on rearview mirrors because they will protect us from car accidents. When sweeping the storefront of your business, sweep toward the front of the door, not away from it, because you don't want to sweep away all your good luck. And when eating fish, eat around the bones or break the bones off. Do not flip the fish over, because it symbolizes a ship capsizing, which is like a business going belly up. <laughs> my mother was never shy about doling out superstitious wisdom, so my nascent concept of life was one where I was in control of my own fate while at the same time tethered by the threads of fatalism. For example, the common refrain for cleaning my bowl at dinner time wasn't that kids in Africa were starving. It was, finish every speck of rice, otherwise your future husband will be pockmarked by each grain you missed. <laughs> well, why wouldn't I want a handsome husband? So of course, I faithfully licked my bowl clean at the end of each meal and eventually willed my way toward a union with a handsome, unpockmarked man. <laughs> And then there was a rule about drop chopsticks. Mother would often remind me and my sister to be careful when we use chopsticks because drop your chopsticks and a misfortune will befall upon you or someone you know at some point in the near future. Okay, sounds ridiculous, but wouldn't you like to know that not one hour after I dropped my chopsticks one evening that a muffled thump cut through the air. And right there on our beige color carpet lay my baby brother writhing and wailing after rolling a foot and a half off the couch like a helpless sack of potatoes. <laughs> As my mother went to pick him up, lamenting in Chinese about what a poor helpless creature he was, all I heard buzzing into my ears was, why'd you have to drop those chopsticks? How many times have I told you about dropping chopsticks? Be careful with those chopsticks. It didn't matter that she wasn't actually saying those things to me because by then, I'd already been conditioned to see that it was only a matter of time before I actually dropped my chopsticks and inevitably caused a horrifying event to take place. <laughs> when it finally happened, when it, I finally dropped them, it didn't take much to convince me that I was the harbinger of my baby brother's cruel misfortune. I had sealed his fate the moment I dropped my chopsticks, my damn chopsticks. <laughs> so from that point on, with the truth laid before me, I bought into the magical, mystical power of superstitions, an omnipresent force that sees all, knows all, and if you dare test it, be prepared for its wrath. Well, this kind of mindset sustained for only so long before the cold hand of truth and logic slapped me in the face. And that slap came in the form of 10-year-old Laura Ng at the beginning of my fifth grade year at Albion Elementary. Laura was the new girl in our class. Laura liked to wear turtlenecks and thick black rimmed glasses and her hair in a ponytail. Laura was from somewhere far and exotic called Northern California. <laughs> and everyone in our fifth grade class was immediately intrigued by the fact that unlike the rest of us children of immigrants who had to fall back on Chinese from time to time, she spoke only English, which made her seem extra special and extra smart. 
Since I was one of the resident smart kids of the class, it wasn't long before Laura and I became friends. We bonded over shared literary texts, like Harry the Spy, and valued each other's interests, mine in drawing and hers in random science trivia. We both cared about school and learning, and we both desperately strived for A's because, well, As we, got close, uh, as we got to know each other, our after-school meetups at our place became routine. We'd watch cartoons, have conversations with her giant pet turtle, and play tag at the park down the street. She learned that I wanted to be an entertainment journalist when I grew up, and I learned that she wanted to be a paleontologist. So oftentimes, we'd end up digging up her backyard, hoping for buried treasure or artifacts, and I'd end up interviewing her about it. <laughs> Everything seemed to be going well, then one day, while we were having lunch at her house, the unthinkable happened. I was nearly finished with my meal. I set my chopsticks across my, my bowl and was about to reach for my drink when, all of a sudden, my right hand connected with the ends of my chopsticks. The moment my index finger made contact, everything seemed to move in slow motion. First, the left chopstick tumbled across my bowl, then it ricocheted off the table, and when my free hand instinctively lunged up to snatch it, it maneuvered a backflip off my arm before plunging helplessly toward the ground. Oh my god, I'm so sorry, I said to Laura as I scrambled to the ground to salvage the stick. Oh, it's okay, it's not like you broke anything. I'll get you another one. Stunned by her calmness, I blurted, what do you mean it's okay? I dropped <laughs> fucking chopsticks. <laughs> Yeah, okay, drop chopsticks, hello, something bad's gonna happen. What are you talking about? At that moment, it dawned on me. Laura didn't know about the chopstick omen, so I properly schooled her on the concept of causality and how my brother almost died because of my own carelessness in the past. Maybe it was the seriousness in my voice or the pleading conviction in my eyes, but the next thing I knew, she was busting out laughing, wiping away tears, and claiming, that's not true. Why would you believe a dumb thing like that? <laughs> I believe it because it happened, I shot back, suddenly aware of the slight quiver of uncertainty in my voice. Then, an unsettling thought crept in. Could my mom have been lying to me all this time? Are we not actually at the mercy of supernatural forces controlling our fates? Laura was pretty confident about being right, and since she was planning on being a brilliant scientist one day, it was hard to argue with someone as smart as her. So we decided on a scientific approach to resolve this, which was to monitor our activities for the next 24 hours for any signs of bad luck or misfortune. <laughs> being the non-believer that she was, Laura was unperturbed by our agreement. I, on the other hand, was caught in a catch-22 where if I was right, something bad will have to ha happen to prove the chopstick omen true. But if I were wrong, I'd have to think back to all those times mom cautioned or admonished me over mundane actions like twitching eyelids or how to eat fish and realize that all those warnings were a load of bupkis. <laughs> that evening over dinner, I limited communication with my mother for fear that I'd break under the pressure of thinking she was a liar all this time. As everyone else was eating and fixated on the TV, I was thinking about Laura and quietly wishing that I had some piece of negative news to report the next day. <laughs> An onset of the cold or flu, a fight with my sister, my brother rolling off the couch again. Hell, I'll even take a paper cut if that proves my point. But nothing came. At school the following morning, I monitored Laura for signs of distress. Any indication that perhaps a relative had gotten ill or an inexplicable rash had suddenly emerged or maybe she had overslept and missed breakfast and was now starving. <laughs> no dice. The school day carried on as usual, hour after hour, lesson after lesson, misfortune free. At the end of the day, I told Laura that she was right. Dropped chopsticks were just dropped chopsticks. She shrugged and asked if I was still coming over to hang out and I said yes and that was that. But you know what? In the end, I felt a certain burden lifted, like I was no longer trapped and no longer beholden to the binds of superstition. In the years that followed, mother continued to disperse omens and warnings, but they fell on deaf ears. In school, I gravitated toward math and science, which gradually helped me see that and relate to the world via logic and observable outcomes. Biology class taught me, taught me the importance of data and empirical evidence, and physics the concepts of forces and action and reaction, while algebra and geometry 
refine my common sense and reasoning skills. I learned about the scientific method and the differences between facts and beliefs and opinions. I relished in knowing that results can be explained through repeated experimentation based on discernible evidence. The more I knew, the more I felt the need to discredit my mom and push back against what she tried to convince me. This eventually led to a total rejection of what both my parents believed in, from their superstitions to their religious rituals to the actions they took to live a safe and protected life. I wasn't going to just believe and accept everything they told me anymore. I had to have proof, substantive proof, that was verified and peer-reviewed through various third-party sources. <laughs> As if books and schooling hadn't already done it, the last 20 odd years of life experiences solidified my view that superstitions are balderdash. I don't get goosebumps on Friday the 13th, nor do I plan to avoid using scissors on the bed when I become pregnant because according to mom, that's how children get hair lips. <laughs> I don't have a lucky shirt that I wear to interviews, and if I say bless you after a sneeze, it would be to maintain conversational protocol, not because I thought I could keep your soul from escaping through your nose. <laughs> when I started WebMDing as an adult, I learned that eye twitches were a result of muscle contractions caused by fatigue or lack of sleep, not by gossip. And when I called my mom last week, even she demystified the chopstick superstition with a rather pedestrian response. It was just a way to get you and your sister to mind your table manners. <laughs> so, I guess, from using, aside from using fear tactics to, to raise their children, my parents apparently had no problem fucking with our sense of reality <laughs> in the name of dining etiquette. Now, having said all this, and in spite of my claims of rejecting superstition and swearing by science and logic, I can't help but feel a tinge of comfort whenever I visit my parents' house. Kind of like when you visit a museum and you feel both connected and disconnected at the same time to the artifacts around you. I can see the two golden lion statues outside the gate, which don't even look like lions at all with their dragon-like faces and fabulous manes of curly dollop, acting as sentinels who vet all visitors before they can meet with masters of the domicile. <laughs> Past the gate, and there are the red, large red lanterns, one bleached from unrelenting days in the sun, hanging over and blessing the porch. And beyond them, the bagua, nailed above the front door, meant to deflect evil spirits. Go through the two main doors and you'll see the large wooden altar in the corner of the family room, featuring the deities of heaven and hell, above and below my grandma, my deceased grandma and grandpa's photos. The lingering fragrance of burnt incense, lit, lit by my mother every morning, tributes to our ancestors, tickle the nose as the eyes wander to all the lucky bamboo throughout the house. The way my mom adorns her house is a far cry from my own Ikea and Target inspired living space. <laughs> mm, but I guess their decorations are kind of like how some people hang up Jesus's and Mary's in their homes. They find comfort in thinking that they have some kind of protection and anchor of control in a world full of uncertainty, nefariousness, and chaos. I don't buy into superstitions anymore, but here we have a phenomenon that is a staple of every culture in every country a belief system that flies in the face of logic, yet traipses along persistently generation after generation, century after century. So, as much as I like to push back against magical thinking of superstitions, the next time I get a twitch in my right eyelid, I'll not be able to help but think, who's talking shit about me now? That was Bamford's timer, the skeptical Michelle Chan!